Uh, welcome to this uh, online event, Stick to Your Knitting, a roundtable conversation the program says on leadership, gender and misplaced metaphor. Well, the round table is rather a square screen around which we have gathered. Um, we knew that Catherine Watson, um, who kind of took um, her, uh, from her mind, sparked the idea for this evening. Catherine is in Canada. We knew that. So um, she's with us from a different time zone. But until a few days ago, Carla, Jan Jaap and myself had hoped to sit together here in the exhibition at the Heerengracht uh, with only Catherine on the screen, but the um, sharper measurements uh, in the light of the pandemic um, have made us decide to all stay, not stick, not with our knitting, but stick to our computer at home. Um, and I think it's um, only fair to do this in these times. Still, I'm really happy that we can do this event. Talking and discussing and developing ideas together is something that is very well possible on the screen. It is um, rather a pity that most of the remaining program of a shame exploring masculinities, especially the workshops, which would require work together in a space theatrically with artists have been postponed uh, for the moment for an, an, in, into an unknown future. I hope not too far from now. Uh, but here we are uh, for tonight and I'm really happy uh, you can be here, also the participants. Uh, thanks for joining us. Um, you at home have the opportunity to look at your smartphone every now and then to check whether there's news in the United States about the elections. I'm trying to refrain from that reflex, although um, I can barely stand the tension. Um, and I think the tension that we feel in the light of the US elections is one of many reasons that um, we felt the urge to talk about masculinities, about shame, uh, about um, yeah, a lot of negative things that come with masculinity, power, power abuse, the boldness, bluntness, uh, we'll probably in the course of the conversation uh, name quite a few of them. Uh, but there are more reasons to talk about that. Of course, here in the Netherlands, um, there is at the moment a um, quite um, heavy um, issue around art academies that sparked from the Royal Academy in The Hague, uh, where we can speak, I guess, uh, quite uh, loudly about toxic masculinity. And not that we need to discuss that tonight, but it is it shows the timeliness and the urgency um, to talk um, about leadership, masculinity, uh, gender, and misplaced metaphor tonight. Um, uh, I hope that most of you know Catherine, Carla, and Jan Jaap, just a few words. Um, Catherine Watson is uh, connected to the University of Groningen at the moment um, as a cultural leader in residence within the two-year research master's degree program in cultural leadership at the Faculty of Arts. Uh, I'm happy that Within that function, we can uh, continue to collaborate because we've been collaborating in your previous positions in very nice projects such as the Tandem Project or uh, the, the round table that has led to the perplex publication that we've done together with the European Cultural Foundation. So it's great uh, to keep on exchanging, Catherine. Uh, Carla is with us, Carla Delfos, the founder of the European League of Institutes of the Arts. Um, of which she was the executive director for 26 years and in that capacity has um, really um, put a stamp on the international arena of higher arts education in Europe and beyond. And currently she's chairing the board of the Art Futures Foundation. And in that capacity has organized a roundtable conversation with a bigger group um, here, I'm not sure, a year ago or so. You have to tell us about it, Carla, in a bit. Um, exactly about um, leadership, but then with female leaders and Jan Jan. <laughs> and then we've got Jan Jan Knoll, um, 
uh, currently the director of the Buchmann Stichting. Uh, so he's not only a colleague, but um, now also a neighbor because the Buchmann Stichting is literally just a few houses down the canal here. But we know each other for many years as well and have collaborated um, in your previous function, at least when you were director of the Fonds Culture Participasi. But you are a policy animal um, uh, uh, throughout your uh, professional existence. Also before that, you've been at the ministry. So when we talk about um, leadership, gender, and, um, and um, what may be needed for future generations of cultural leaders, I think you can contribute with your broad knowledge of the cultural sector and policy today. This uh, conversation takes place in an exhibition that I cannot show you now completely. You see a few works uh, behind me. Uh, there, there are two works by Marlene Dumas, the Bearded Beauties, they are called. Those are not uh, men, but women with beards. Uh, there are many more beautiful works of Marlene throughout the exhibition. You will see um, a lot of works by Natasha Kensio, the drawings behind me. Um, but there's also work by Hans Hofi, Ina von Zell, Janet Christensen, and many more. Uh, there is a video registration on our website, which you can visit, but you can also come and see it. We are still open. We are not a museum, uh, but still it means we cannot uh, have more than two people at the same time uh, in the exhibition. So you have to drop us an email. But if you wish to see it, I can recommend it. Um, just send an email and pass by Probably it will be next week, but there's a free slot. Uh, why did we make an exhibition on shame and masculinities? Um, it is, of course, the way that H401 uh, works for many years. Uh, since, uh, let's say, roughly 10 years, we are um, organizing a public program. And each of the thematic year programs that we organize take our own history um, an issue from our own history of this place, of this building, and related to a, to a pressing social political issue of that very moment. So we are not na uh, navel gazing with uh, choosing these issues, but it um, is a kind of um, urge to, um, to explore ourselves and things that we find within ourselves uh, we recognize often in the society around us. So we have made programs about freedom, friendship, cultural memory, uh, the female perspective in the years when we really wanted um, to get the perspective of our foundation still in, the group fanaticism. And um, in the last years when we were confronted, um, quite roughly confronted with abuse in the history of this place, mainly by one of our co-founders, Wolfgang Formel, and in his circles. Um, we had to work through this history um, and we couldn't do that alone with a, with a commission and with um, a lot of people uh, that were involved in that. So um, with that behind us, um, Ernst von Aufen, who curated this exhibition, approached us saying, listen, now, now it's time from this a history of your own to look to the outside world where we see toxic masculinity as uh, a problem where me too has um, opened up conversations and uh, Ernst proposed an exhibition and we uh, built a program around it on shame and masculinity and we are very happy that Valise Publishers, a fantastic publishing house um, that I adore for their uh, wonderful books in the last years um, has uh, made an accompanying book with essays and artworks in it, Shame and Masculinity, which I can recommend. And I keep it here um, in order for us to maybe highlight uh, the one or other thing at a certain moment. Um, a year or so ago in the studio of Giselle, we had this round table that I already mentioned with, uh, uh, with um, leaders, women mostly from the cultural world. And after that, in a conversation with Catherine, uh, Catherine sparked uh, the idea of metaphor and not only in a conversation, but she um, put it down in writing in a text uh, that um, was available on our website for everyone who registered to this um, online event. 
Um, if you haven't found it, I mean, it's a big button saying download it here. Uh, go to um, go to uh, our website and the events and to the today's event, and you can download it. It's not necessary to read it now because I would like to give now first the word to Catherine, who will share, I guess, main thoughts um, that lie behind this essay and maybe a few triggering um, provocations uh, for Carla and Jan Jaap to follow up on. Um, can I give the word to you, Catherine? Thanks for being here and for inspiring us with this text. Thank you, Lars. It's certainly a real pleasure to be um, to be with you, to join you either in the round or in the square <laughs> from, from distance. As we know, distance can be just around the corner these days in that we can't physically meet or halfway around the world. And um, while it's uh, distancing the technology has enabled us actually to bring people closer together from much farther away. Uh, so I suppose with everything we have to see some kind of a, uh, a silver lining. Um, the, 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 the essay that Lars mentioned and is published online is a reflection and it was written, has been written during this pandemic and in the context of shame or in the consideration of the exhibit shame. And it recalls, as Lars mentioned, a round table that we had um, about a year ago that Carla and Jan Yap were also participating in, where we talked about human leadership, or I raised the, the uh, sparked the conversation around human leadership, as opposed to male or female leadership, because we, we had been talking about how leadership is often defined in, um, uh, an, in a gendered way. And not to be uh, negative at all, I just, what I wanted to raise was the ability, is it possible for us to um, ungender some of these characteristics that we specifically had tied either to men or to women, and then very stereotypically describe leaders based on those rather gendered um, qualities or that had been uh, gendered. It, it's, um, the text is it is very much personal and it reflects, I, I have to say, my Western and my Anglophone uh, perspective. There is language uh, or consideration of language involved in the text, but I've no doubt whatsoever that whatever language you dream in, whatever language you think in, you can find examples uh, that relate. This is not purely um, a, an Anglophone perspective, but it is my, uh, to use another gendered metaphor, my mother tongue. Um, the, the, the essay is the, the three themes of, of gender leadership and metaphor, I think are all academically rich. Any of those pathways you decide to choose, there's been much writing, much thinking about them, much, much philosophy, but mine, the essay is not a scholarly investigation by any means. I wanted to um, first reflect a little bit on the exhibit and um, the texts that appear in relation to the exhibit and the, the, the videos that are online. And I encourage people to have a look. If you don't have the opportunity to see the exhibit, have a look at the videos and the interviews. Um, the exhibit, as it's noted, presents different manifestations of shame. And I think that's important to keep in mind that we don't see ourselves fixed in one specific definition. Uh, Ernst van Alphen in the video further describes that and the range, if one could say, or the, 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 the development of shame in, in different ways. But I think whatever the understanding is of shame, it has an opposite. Um, Ernst mentions, and he talks a bit about shame and respect or shame and dignity. The starting point for my reflection is shame in opposition to pride, especially in the consideration of the role that shame plays in leadership. And I would say the importance of shame in leadership and the understanding of what happens when there's shamelessness in leadership. In the video tour of the exhibit, uh, Ina Van Zyl says that shamelessness is barbaric. And I would say pride without being moderated by shame is certainly destructive uh, and toxic. The balance, I think, between opposites that results in a certain harmony 
I um, smile to see the work of Hans Hovey, his uh, sculptures in the exhibit. I think he embraces in his exhibits a certain harmony. And he speaks um, also in the video of the importance of the inner and outer, the inside and outside, the beauty of what's not seen and the beauty of what is hidden and the importance of seeing inside. So these, these opposites and how you bring these together in uh, a, a harmony. So our pandemic and the geographic distance of where I find myself now has meant that I've not been able to see the exhibit, if I could say, in the flesh, um, but I'm drawn to it nevertheless uh, as a physical, and if I could say handcrafted, it's a, he's a ceramicist, um, manifestation of the potential of harmonizing shame and pride, of bringing a full range of qualities that we had either um, attributed to either men or to women and distinctly said one is masculine, one is feminine, to both, to, in other words, to, to human, uh, our human qualities and therefore qualities that are needed to truly, to truly lead. Um, and you know, it's rather utopic to look at this kind of harmonizing and an equal balance. And given uh, what we are aware of all around us every day and all the time, unfortunately, we have a long way to go in that. But I think it is the route that one would hope we need to go. Um, so also we, we build this, uh, this, these oppositions or these uh, polarities um, are built upon millennia word and, and images that have embedded gender stereotypes into every aspect of our culture. And that brings me, of course, to the third thread of the reflection that of metaphor. And here I'd like to quote the wonderful book of Zia Haider Rahman in the light of what we know, where he says in a few short words that metaphors are never only anything. They are not innocent. Um, so metaphor or the, the use of language in certain ways is not innocent and as is uh, image generally not innocent. So just, just as uh, sexuality and shame or lack thereof has been shaped, our visual representation of that has been shaped and rooted in classicism, so too is our language. I think these concepts of shame, shamelessness, sexuality and gender um, were prevalent in the very first physical images of the human, uh, of men and of women. Um, the metaphor that I reflected on, stick to your knitting, which is kind of a curious and, and humorous one, it carries a lot of baggage. Um, and I, I talk about in the article how it has been used and then how I frankly, based on the, the kind of, um, perceptions that it built in me, I understood it a certain way and others would argue that it was another way. I understood it always as a very gendered and very um, negative uh, reproach, usually to a woman to stay out of where she was not wanted and to stick to the things that she knew well and which were not valued in the other, in the other area. Um, it, it, there was quite a well-known case in Canada in a political arena where uh, one, a male politician suggested that a female politician should stick to her knitting and this caused a great furor. Um, and the attempt had been to uh, explain that it wasn't actually about um, that she should as a woman be knitting or cooking or doing any number of homely things and not in the male arena of, the, of politics, but rather that it related to an industrial revolution commentary where um, if, especially with things like knitting machines, that a company that specialized in one thing or an industry that specialized in one thing was best to stick with that. So for me, I, would, I, I also was found this rather humorous because that in itself is, is equally negative to say to someone, or assume that diversification is not a value, that uh, being you know, uh, blinkered in, in how we approach things is, is how we should do it. So either way, whether uh, which one is right, and one could argue any metaphor, and oftentimes people do say, well, I didn't mean to say that. 
fact is how it's not always what you that the words that you said it's how those words have been uh, deeply um, embedded in the receiver or in visual work in the, the viewer. Um, and it, the, it, so it has a lot of baggage and it is rooted in this rather humble, homely act, which uh, in the, the um, essay, I talk a lot about shame and humbleness. So shame, not so much as in, 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 in guilt, but shame as in uh, introspection. Um, and the, this humble and homely act, as I said, has translated into rather a powerful collective metaphor. And that is one of the other pieces that I wanted to note in that it, it's, if we think about knitting as a handcraft, but the word knitting together, and especially in these times, it's never been more urgent than to knit together to address complex urgencies, to bring together diversities, to bring together, uh, to, to, to uh, build bridges and to knit together and to have leadership that is skilled in knitting. So leadership that knows how to bring together rather than how to divide and how to tear apart. Thanks very much, Catherine. Um, I think it's a fantastic overview of your text and these three main areas. Maybe later, after Carla and uh, Jan Jaap have given their statement, we can get back to the, to the skills, because there is one paragraph in your text also where you describe characteristics um, of a male leader and softer skills that would maybe um, complement them to, a, to, the, to, to have the real spectrum, not as an opposition to them, but to, to fill the spectrum. Um, but first, um, I would like to give the word to Carla and um, not necessarily to react to Catherine, but to uh, bring in your reflections for the conversation later, please. Thank you, Lars. Thank you for this uh, organizing this interesting uh, square table. And um, yeah, Catherine, you spoke about human leadership uh, as a that's a utopic wish, and uh, I totally agree with that. But uh, in my well, in my actions, um, uh, the female leadership is still something to address. Um, I've been working in the European cultural sector for almost uh, 45 years. And I'm really truly disappointed by the progress that is made for the po position of women. And uh, today to be a woman with an ambition is still uh, a big challenge, so to say. And after a, a, a long violent and humiliating struggle um, 100 years ago, voting rights for women were introduced and the expectation was there that the world would change, they would change quickly. Now it's 2020, uh, we are 100 years further and the global gender gap index of the World Economic Forum shows that equality of men and women is progressing very slowly. And in some countries it's even going backwards. Very generally speaking, 68% of women are treated equal, equal and therefore 32% not. And um, in the round table on female leadership uh, and in the network I initiated, the Disorderly Women Alliance, we were speaking about, uh, or we are speaking about what we can do to make life easier for the next generation of women. That's one of our uh, tasks, duties. And we discuss questions like uh, what influence has being a woman on our careers? And do women have a prominently different style in leading? How is the world looking at us? And how are we looking at ourselves? And do we adjust ourselves? And are we proud if we are called one of the boys or are we going our own path? Well, all, all important questions to, to discuss. 
Uh, Margrethe Vestager, I don't know if I pronounce it rightly, the, the vice president of the European Commission, she said, if a woman wants to go places, she should bring her own ladder. Well, we are uh, constantly confronted with new insights and uh, changes of values, behavior that was considered perfectly normal suddenly is, uh, and that we were really proud of, is suddenly is considered embarrassing and shameful. You're, we're talking about it, and the, the exhibition is about it. For instance, yeah, colonialization, the Me Too movement, Black, type, Black Lives Matter. Um, it's all, it's, it all has to do with uh, creating awareness. And when I saw the painting in the exhibition of Bautusse in drag of Natasha Kensmill, it shocked me. And uh, that is what art is doing. It is touching you, it shocks you, it makes you think, it opens your mind, it gives you new insights. And every interpretation you have, if you are watching it, is valid. It's, it's your interpretation, it's yours. And that makes it so important in my mind. And when I saw Bautus in drag, I saw him with different eyes. And uh, looking at it, I saw all kinds of images of leaders, um, leaders from the past, leaders, leaders from the present, men and women, mostly men, of course. And I was seeing them with different eyes. Who, who are they? Why are they presenting themselves like that? Why are they dressed like that? So building awareness consciously and unconsciously is in my mind an essential part of the process towards equality and for that we need art we need artists and we need high quality uh, education and um you're also Catherine, we were talking about language and i i just heard a very interesting example from iceland that i would like to end my uh, my talk with with the um, in Iceland, they officially changed the, uh, the word for abortion. So it used to be a word with the meaning elimination of the fetus. And now they have a word that means termination of pregnancy. And that was done officially. It was done, done through the government. And for me, that is a, an interesting example of how we can influence bias thinking. And I want to leave it here. Thanks very much, Carla, for um, facts and figures. I think it's really, really important to uh, get those in as well. And also for another misplaced metaphor, one of the boys who wants to be one of the boys, <laughs> if you can be one of the girls. I always wanted to be one of the girls, but that's a different story. Um, Building awareness, I think, is um, important uh, because when we talk about the skills later um, that uh, Catherine also refers to or ca characteristics, we can maybe get back to that point of how to build awareness. You were saying art, artists and education, and I think this is something to follow up on that thread. Uh, but first, uh, Jan Jaap, please, um, I want to ask you to contribute your thoughts. Yeah, thank you, Lars. Um, at your introduction, you uh, said some words about the article in the uh, NSA Handelsblatt uh, this weekend, and uh, uh, you also refer to the dark past of abuse uh, in uh, the house of uh, Heere Gracht. And I do think uh, that uh, on this occasion, uh, on the occasion of this talk, uh, about the exhibition on uh, toxic masculinity. It is important uh, to uh, uh, spend some thoughts uh, on this article in the NSA Handelsblatt. Uh, 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 it was really a, a shocking uh, article, a sickening article about uh, violent and uh, mental and sexual abuse by an upcoming uh, artist, Julian Anderweg. And, um, what uh, was so shocking for me uh, in the article that it once again uh, um, made clear how long uh, can be looked away from signals of abuse, how long 
uh, it can be silent around the victims, uh, where the interests of the victims uh, should be uh, central. Too often, uh, other interests are uh, put central. And um, well, I think it's 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 very important to to think uh, how, by way of self-examination in organizations in the cultural sector. Um, we better understand how this can happen, this this terrible uh, behavior, how it can be tolerated, and uh, of course also how to uh, deal with it and to avoid uh, these situations in the future. And it, it it will not be solved by introducing more codes of conduct or uh, appointing more counselors, more protocols. It's it's it really calls for self-examination among uh, managers in the cultural sector, as is happening now in the Arts Academy. Um, the second point I would like to uh, 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 make is, uh, and that um, uh, is uh, also connected to the things um, Carla has just said, there is uh, a big inequality still existing uh, between men and women in uh, the arts world. Of course, uh, there are uh, lots of women working in the arts world. There are great women artists, uh, needless to say so. But then again, if you look at some figures, uh, uh, for example, uh, the, the Volkskrant uh, did a study among the representation of women artists in museums that was published uh, end of uh, 2019. And uh, just to, to share a few uh, numbers with you uh, that uh, of about uh, the ways the works on show in the Stedelijk Museum in the exhibition hall, 11% uh, was uh, by women artists and 4% uh, work of women artists was in the collection. So, um, and, and there are more figures uh, uh, I could quote. And I know museums are working on this. I think a great example is the Van Abbe Museum. Uh, that has decided that uh, half of the budget for uh, 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 buying new works should be uh, uh, spent on work by women artists, half of the budget. Um, and um, I hope more uh, uh, institutions uh, will uh, follow that type of active uh, policy on this to, to help um, uh, overcome uh, existing inequalities then to the uh, uh, theme of Catherine on leadership, uh, human leadership. I love that notion. Maybe, Lars, you can uh, share a slide of two works in the exhibition uh, with everybody. Yes, there it is, the two paintings by Ina van Zijl. Here you look at two human leaders, in my uh, opinion. Uh, uh, Barack Obama, uh, he... Uh, he talked about leadership himself by stressing the importance of humility, for example, as an as a as an, a very important uh, element of uh, uh, leadership. And uh, humility uh, 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 goes uh, very well uh, uh, together with with a type of shame that Catherine uh, clarified when she opposed it to pride. She said. Uh, Pride uh, without uh, shame is synonym with uh, shamelessness. And uh, well, uh, needless to mention the name of the successor of Barack Obama uh, uh, to uh, get a pra practical example of uh, shameless uh, uh, leadership. Um, Angela Merkel uh, is uh, uh, painted in a very different way uh, uh, than Barack Obama. Huh? Barack Obama uh, has this inward uh, Look and uh, Angela uh, Merkel uh, has more uh, this uh, this this uh, 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 toughness in her uh, look, uh, and I think that's um, uh, 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 very right. Uh, Angela Merkel, she has so often been characterized as uh, uncharismatic, uh, not fashionable, uh, always judged by her appearance. Uh, but actually, she is a very human leader uh, uh, who doesn't need a display of power uh, uh, to uh, be effective as a, as a leader. And um, 
well, these, uh, uh, finding these two people that I really admire together in the exhibition, both great examples of, uh, of human leadership, of servant leadership. Uh, I think uh, they uh, uh, can uh, inspire uh, uh, a lot of leaders, also leaders in the cultural uh, uh, sector. And um, for now, I would like to leave it with that, uh, Lars. Thank you. Thank you, Jan Jan. Um, again, um, nice that you illustrate your thoughts with, uh, with works from the exhibition also. Um, I noted for myself to, to later get back to this self-examination, which is something similar than the awareness, building awareness. I think this is something that Carla also raised. Uh, so there we could develop a thought a little bit further. Uh, and the proactive policies like the 50-50 um, policy in acquisitions in the Fanabe Museum, I think those are really good examples where we could maybe um, say a few words about that later in order to um, get a clearer grip on how we get to that human leadership that, yeah, we see in examples like Merkel and Obama. But um, can I ask you, Catherine, when you hear Carla and Jan Jaap um, uh, elaborating um, on our theme, um, and you um, said in a preparatory talk, um, well, it's not about oppositions, it's about a spectrum. And um, well, but it's also about awareness because most of the time you are in one point part of the spectrum and you look to the other side. Uh, how can we how can we uh, incorporate the thinking that Carla and Jan or, uh, Jan Jaap also contributed, um, if we can do that at all? But uh, maybe you can reflect a bit on what you've heard. Um, well, I think it's what both Carla and Jan Jaap have very um, uh, clearly presented, which is so valuable, is our our context, which is so difficult to change, and we perpetuate the same thing. Um, we try to, uh, um, especially when faced with uh, particular situations that, that make things very obvious and very acute. So to pick up on what Jan Yap had said with the article uh, in, the, in the NRC, and actually I would relate that to uh, male politicians in the United States is this sense of the action was, has been part of a sanctioned way of being within our society. So even in the NRC article, now I read it um, online, so it may be different how it's the headlines work. The article itself is very in depth with all of the, 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 the horrific situation and the individual experiences and very much the, the inappropriateness of it all and the, 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 the consideration of what the sector was doing. The NRSA also chose to um, use in one of its subheadlines a description of this artist being a bad boy. We have embedded in our language and in this the, the, the um, justification of behavior as um, bad boys, what boys will do, you know, th this kind of thing. So I just want to say we perpetuate that even in how we report things that are happening now. So I think we need to have such a rupture with how we have done things before in terms of um, uh, making things, you know, bringing things out in the open and addressing them and, and also um, changing or realizing to, to pick up what uh, Jan Jaap had said, the self-examination or responsibility, both on an individual level, but also on a collective level. And whether that collective collectivity is something like uh, in this, this case, this example, the visual arts or the, uh, or the, the education system, in, in, again, in this case, a visual artist, where there seemed to be a sense that this, this type of behavior brought an energy that was uh, valued within that, uh, within a certain generation of that sector, or going back to the, the, the political example that past acts 
of politicians were within a certain time, a certain context, a certain um, understanding of how men and women should act, but in this case of, of how men could act. And then that became a way of explaining rather than uh, saying outright that this was in fact wrong. Um, so I think one thing we face is this perpetuation and inability to, to break things effectively is it continues. And I, I think in one of the things I was trying to talk about or I'm trying to talk about in the, the reflection, the paper that I wrote is about how deeply embedded these are and um, how we change them. It needs to go at the root of how we, uh, how we raise uh, children, how we nurture young people, uh, the examples that we, that are there and um, what, how we present the, and deal with things that are um, wrong and are, will stop us from moving in any kind of way towards inequality and towards, um, uh, yeah, a humanness that I think we need in our um, gender relationships. Um, Carla, maybe I can, um, uh, maybe you can follow up on this a little bit because you um, you also talked about uh, building awareness and you mentioned art, artists and education. And I, if I understand Catherine right, then she's talking about media who are kind of a mirror and the way they um, um, write about um, American politicians or um, misbehavior uh, or, and help in a, in a certain way in that soul searching, in that soul examination. But we also need critical friends, I think. We also need a kind of empathetic way of uh, getting to know ourselves. Um, is this where you thought about when you mentioned art and artists and the, the role artists play in our own uh, soul searching and soul examination or did you did you um, see that differently what what were your thoughts about how we learn to be better leaders or more equal well i'm i'm i i'm convinced that artists and 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 or looking reading looking at artworks or looking at or watching theater or hearing music opens the mind and makes you because we as people we are very much um, uh, uh, closed in or a prisoner of our own thoughts and our own uh, ideas and and uh, yeah art helps you opening up and um, uh, so so I think that can be a great help but I think also uh, the artists themselves have to be made aware of what they can what they can uh, accomplish Mm -hmm. And uh, and well, the uh, the the story about uh, the, the artist in the in the, in the newspaper that they were writing about in the newspaper, that is of course something that has been going on in art schools a lot. And uh, I'm at the moment uh, um, working with ELIA, European League of Institutes of the Arts, and they would like to they they, they will address this theme. And I did a kind of survey for them. Uh, with some of the art schools, and the outcome is uh, worse than I thought. It's quite shocking, in fact. Uh, it seems that e uh, still 20% of the in the answers said that there is no equality in salary, still. But also, there are no good protocols in place um, for kind of, yeah, let's say, Me Too uh, uh, situations. Like Jan Jaap said, uh, they, they have a code of conduct and then they think it's covered. And it's not because there are still uh, quite a lot of uh, things happening that nobody uh, dares to talk about. So it continues. And, uh, and I think it has to be addressed. And, and now Elia will at least uh, address it in, in a certain way. I'm also convinced that it, it needs to be addressed in education and, and not only higher arts education, higher education, but also with young children, very young children, because that's where it starts. Okay, thanks Carla. Um, uh, Jan Jaap, uh, to, to get back to the 
proactive politics of, for instance, Panaba, or probably there are other examples where um, one can define a, a clear um, protocol or action line, you know, 50%. Half of the budget. It's it's very clear, but um, uh, I'm I'm wondering whether the sustainable change uh, isn't more about a cultural change. To bring it back also to what 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 Catherine said um, about the way how we report things and how we talk about issues and problems and, and challenges. It's maybe also about a language, a use of language. To bring it back to metaphor. <laughs> because we use metaphors easily, we use words easily, and um, to paraphrase Zia, maybe also words are never just words. Um, they have a, an intrinsic load that is um, you know, passed down by generations. How do we change institutional cultures? Um, probably not by policies that say 50-50. But it is maybe a way of um, yeah how we interact with one another. Um, is that something you uh, you have thoughts about, uh, Jan? Yeah. Well, um, of course you are right that uh, there is uh, much more needed than just uh, uh, setting targets or quota or. Uh, but on the other hand, um, the. Um, the good thing about uh, uh, quota, uh, like the Van Abbe did with uh, uh, the, the budget for uh, women artists, is that you make it much more concrete uh, what you would like to achieve. Uh, of course, uh, in the ideal uh, situation, uh, we uh, it wouldn't be uh, uh, a discussion about the difference between female leadership, male leadership, you indeed talk about human leadership and neither female artists, male artists, you, you, you talk about uh, artists as, as, as uh, human beings. But um, I think, the, uh, again, the, the good thing of targets is that you make it more uh, concrete. But it's not only about uh, budgets, of course, it's also about uh, leadership uh, positions and... Um, uh, it is indeed also about uh, um, language. Uh, coming back uh, to uh, the, uh, uh, the the example of the bad boy uh, that Catherine uh, referred to from the article, uh, uh, remember that, that Donald Trump tried to um, well um, uh, be uh, very relaxed about his uh, misbehavior by qualifying it as locker room talk and, and, and as soon as long as you get away with um, uh, clarifying yourself by using this type of uh, it all, it's also innocent it's it's all uh, locker room talk of course that's bullshit it's not locker room talk it's uh, uh, offensive uh, behavior and uh, so um, uh, language can can cover a lot, um, but coming back to the the need uh, for uh, for change in uh, culture, uh, of course you then also have to uh, uh, look about uh, the the working uh, uh, conditions, uh, being aware that there's a, a lot of precarity uh, in the artist uh, uh, sector, where uh, uh, the uh, average income of visual artists is very low. What does that mean for the uh, the choices? Uh, does uh, a male visual artist um, uh, let his uh, uh, his partner, uh, his uh, woman, uh, do the do the earnings, or uh, and and does a visual a female visual artist make the same choice, or does she give up her uh, uh, time she spends in uh, in the arts to? Uh, uh, to earn uh, money other ways, yeah? so it's uh, it, it it's the, the whole issue of the inequality calls for uh, uh, a, a discussion, dialogue on on uh, with reference to all aspects of the arts world, and uh, that's also uh, I think what uh, what you need uh, for change, uh, uh, not only uh, uh, targets and not only protocols of codes of conduct, but you need uh, a lot of uh, uh, talking. Uh, 
uh, uh, like we are uh, doing right now, but also uh, in uh, uh, other contexts. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, uh, one more time, Catherine. Um, in, in one of our, just, I want to add one more uh, thought to that, because in one of our uh, preparatory talks, you uh, you said something that also Nalina Malani, one of the video art Indian video artists here in the exhibition, that made a, a stunning and, and confronting work about rape, um, uh, said, "Well, it's 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 about recognizing a difference on the one hand, or making the woman the other, which is the humiliating thing." And you, I remember, Catherine, you also talked about not bringing bridging the gap or, or unifying the differences, but recognizing, recognizing a difference. Maybe you could elaborate a little bit on this also, because I think that this may help us in, the, in our thinking about um, how to change a culture. Absolutely, um, recognizing difference and um, valuing difference and knowing that we need the diversity and and range of perspectives um, equally. And I think what I'd like to also say is we, we need to look at equality on, um, in all aspects. So it's an intersectoral approach to how we have to look at where we arrive, hopefully someday at a, um, a more equal place for, for everyone, whether it's men or women, or whether it's different ages, uh, different um, uh, cultural backgrounds, uh, different uh, socioeconomic situations. But these, these divides that we have created to know that we have to find some, uh, we have to work towards some kind of balance. Finding it is maybe a difficult, uh, it, it assumes that it's there and we just have to trip, up, trip on it and we'll be there. I think one thing to keep in mind is how long it has taken us as humankind, although we're a speck in the development of the universe, but how long it has taken us to arrive at where we are in what we consider our rather civilized and advanced um, society. It's taken that time to embed all these inequalities. It's going to take a long time to redress them. But just because it's going to take a long time doesn't mean that we can't take assertive steps. So here to find a way to look at how we um, take positive action as, as the examples that, that you have used, which, which, which tend to be maybe um, uh, mundane and in some cases they would seem more benign, but they need to be taken to maybe help the forward motion, which is going to be a longer time and is going to require, as Carla mentioned, um, that, that we are changing uh, over generations from the time children are inf infants. So every, the world that they are living in is a more uh, equal world and a greater understanding of that. But that, that we are not trying to um, make things homogenous all the same. I mean, that is uh, the worst part, the, 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 the worst way of thinking, you know. It's it more about recognizing and valuing the, the range of things. And I'd like to bring it back also to that understanding of shame and the, the need to have, um, whether we look at it as a humbleness, whether we look at it as a homeliness or a soft skill, but we have to bring both the shame and the pride because I think pride is an important thing as well. Confidence is an important thing as well but not necessarily to say, how do we build the perfect leaders? It's how do we embed that in the leadership qualities that every person should have, regardless of where they see themselves fitting in terms of leading or following, but as a, um, as a human being to, to, to bring that together. And you need uh, the balance of, of shame and pride. But I think the, the biggest is to, to recognize this will take a long time. It's going to take even longer if we perpetuate the same kind of uh, language and the same kind of um, conversations around things and justify things by, by previous situations and not say, well, that has to change. We don't accept it anymore. Thank you, Catherine.
Uh, I think um, I'm, I'm tempted to leave it with this because it's it's a really nice wrap up of this conversation and also not only a wrap up, but also an outlook and a kind of, um, uh, I'm tempted to say battle cry, but that's again a metaphor I shouldn't maybe not use. Uh, but it's a call to action, a call to keep the conversation going, a call to uh, keep soul searching ourselves for self-awareness and a call to um, humbleness and care for future generations. I think this was was really important. And, and I want to uh, repeat um, also the role of the arts and education that was brought in, uh, which I think is what keeps us going uh, in what we are doing. Um, I want to thank the three of you um, for this um, event, but also and especially for the preparation of the event. It was a real, real pleasure to uh, lead also the conversations that led up to tonight. Um, we will share the recording of this event uh, together with Catherine's text so that other people can still dive in. And I'm sure um, as we are in an ongoing conversation anyway, that uh, more will spark off from this conversation. And everyone that has attended, I want to thank as well uh, for your time and um, repeat the invitation to see the exhibition while it is possible. Um, and end maybe again with a quote from Ina van Zyl that was uh, mentioned earlier. Shame is neither good nor bad, but shamelessness is very good. Thanks for this event and being here. Good night.